Hello and welcome to the Food Climate Podcast. I'm Guillaume, your host, and each week, I'm fortunate to share with you stories from climate tech founders, investors, and corporations sharing their unique insights into this fast-moving industry. Eventually, like me, you will learn, discover, and get inspired by those unique men and women who are contributing to the fight against climate change, and I hope it will help you to take a step in this formidable movement. So before we start, I just want to share a few words about us as this podcast is just the tip of the iceberg of what we do at Startup Basecamp to support the climate tech movement. Our mission is to accelerate capital deployment towards climate tech founders, allowing them to focus on scaling their solutions. How do we do that? Every day, we help founders access to resources and connections and gain the visibility they need to expand their growth. We do this in a number of ways with a membership platform, a Slack group, with a growing number of founders, investors, and experts from around the world. And recently, we went one step further with the matching services to connect founders with top climate tech investors. Keep in mind that we are able to do all of this thanks to the support of our listeners and our members. So please like and subscribe, share one episode with a friend, join our community, and if you haven't already done so, make a small donation to support our work. It really means the world to us. And now, enjoy the show! Hi everyone, during this new episode of Founder Series, we sat down with John De Souza, co-founder and president of Ample. Ample is solving the problem of delivering energy to electric vehicles with a solution that provides autonomous battery swapping for electric vehicles and makes driving EVs as simple and cheap as gasoline cars. John's international background provided a fascinating perspective to our discussion on electric vehicles and entrepreneurship which he gained during his formative years spent in Ethiopia and Dubai, where he learned that founding a company is much more common than we think, and we shouldn't be afraid of the risk. John then established himself in the US and had a long career in tech and health. He was later looking to buy an electric car when he realized that EVs were still not easy to charge quickly and drive long distances. That was the genesis of AMP. In this episode, Jones gives a captivating look at electric vehicles industry, beginning with an examination of what major markets have done to increase the adoption of EVs. He then dives into the main challenges of EV phase and why current subsidies are misguided. From there, he moves into the infrastructure difficulties EVs face how more charging stations are not just the answer due to a multitude of considerations and why Ample's simple solution is a needed alternative for a technology we hope to build but do not yet have. To the second part of the show, John gives some as of yet unheard tips on the Tech for Climate podcast about how to make sure you get the most of your fundraising round. John, welcome to the show. Hi, John. Welcome to the Tech for Climate podcast. I'm super happy to have you here with us today. I believe it's going to be a great opportunity to hear your story and learn more about your exciting adventure to solve the energy delivery challenge for electric transportation by utilizing autonomous robotics and smart battery technology that you develop with Ample. So welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Looking forward to this. So before we start, uh, it's the tradition in the show, can you give us a 30 second introduction about Ample? Uh, so Ample is solving the problem of delivering energy to electric vehicles. Uh, when we started this, we realized that we're trying to move a lot of the world from gas to electric. And uh, gas works really well because filling gas is very simple. You stop for a few minutes, you fill your gas and you drive away. With electric, it can be a lot more complicated. And it's hard to persuade a lot of people to switch from one mode that's very easy to another mode that's difficult. And so for us, we wanted to come up with a way that made electric as simple, convenient, and as cheap as gas. And so we came up with a way to do autonomous battery swapping. And that's what Ample is, autonomous battery swapping for electric vehicles. 
So let's start from the, from the top. Can you tell us a bit more about your personal story and background? I mean, what are you passionate about? What do you love to do besides building Ample? What makes you feel inspired or like your best self? As I always ask, who is John? <laughs> well, by way of background, I was actually born in Ethiopia. Uh, we, uh, we were living there. We left during the revolution out there. Um, and then eventually went through a few countries. I finished my high school in Dubai and came to the U.S. for uh, for university. Um, so that's the background. That's in terms of what I'm passionate about. Is I actually do uh, I do love people. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. But it's um, I grew up in Ethiopia, where it's a it, it is a large village of a lot of people, and and you you have your family of extended people. And I, I think I enjoy I enjoy spending time with people. I enjoy being with people. Uh, enjoy working and improving the lives of uh, of the village we, we live in, which is a large village, uh, a global village that out there. And so a lot of what I've done has been focused on that, is that uh, how do you connect with people? How do you spend time with it? And I think we live in a world where it's very easy to disconnect from other people, to to, to get yourself mired in this virtual world. Um, and so I, I want to keep it sort of real, not virtual. <laughs> I want to keep it at, where we can still connect with people, uh, spend time with them, you know, learn and, and do what it takes to 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 connect and improve each other's lives so now tell us a bit more about like your previous uh, you know work and life experience before the, the launch of ample i mean i saw that uh, you're a serial entrepreneurs uh, you're also an investor so you've been very active on the health medtech uh, ecosystem even work for uh, goldman sachs so I mean, what did you learn along that uh, long and extensive journey already um, in a way that gave you this edge to start the, the company? Maybe you have like one or two uh, pieces of, uh, you know, gold nuggets of experiences that uh, you can recall and define as such. You know, it's interesting when you're when you've lived in uh, in uh, in I would say in, in villages or other environments, one thing you realize when you watch people is creativity entrepreneurship is the norm. Uh, when when I was living in, uh, in Dubai, for example, it'd be very common for people to start businesses out of need. Uh, there'd be a family that um, maybe the husband lost a job, the wife lost a job, the other person would jump in and say, maybe I can start a business selling food, selling this or importing stuff from one country. Into it. So it, it was incredible to watch how willing people were to start businesses, to take risks, to do what it, uh, was involved. I think that taught me a lot of stuff that I feel that when we go through and we have this privilege, we've gone through great universities, got a great education, the bar to take the risk gets very high. And, uh, and a lot of people get scared. You know, they, what would happen if I fail? So I would say the first thing in terms of going through and thinking about it was the ability to take risk and realize that in a lot of cases, even if it fails, it's not going to be that bad. Uh, so I think it's an important one you go through. And what I mean by that is, if you have people around you that care for you, that love you, if things go south, you still have the people that care for you and love you. <laughs> That's You still have that. So it gives you the comfort to say, I can always fall back on what matters, as opposed to saying what matters to me is, is for people to think I'm a great entrepreneur or think them. So having that core around you, uh, I think is very important. The same thing I'll say that uh, in terms of going through that taught me a lot was people are very creative with fundraising in other countries. I think when you live in, uh, in, in some countries, you get to realize that it's all venture capital or private equity, but people are raising money all around the world in very innovative ways. You know, they may pool money, they may be doing other things. Uh, and so it opens your eyes that there are access to capital beyond just a few pockets that can help you. It may not be what you need to reach large amounts, but maybe enough to get you started. Uh, so I, I think in terms of being creative and going through and understanding that, uh, you know, is, is very important. Uh, and I said the last step in terms of uh, uh, that is, is having people uh, that care about you, but also people that want you to do well, uh, because people talk about networking, but a lot of networking is sort of connecting and, and I, I don't think it goes that deep. But when over time you've connected with people that, that you care about each other and want each other to do well, you have this lot of people out there helping you, and that's a real help that you help each other really uh, moves things forward. So from my background, uh, I've been in a lot of different industries. I started from the technology. I went to the finance industry, to the healthcare industry. I realized a couple of things about myself. Uh, I do enjoy learning. Every time you go into an, a new industry, there's a tremendous opportunity to go and learn. It's exciting, and, and it, for me, it's very passionate. It's going through 
and seeing what there is new. But the second part of it is how does it connect to what you know? So there's a part of saying, well, I knew all this stuff from one industry. I can map it to this new industry. And bringing those realizations over to the new industry gives you a very different edge than people who are already in industry. What makes each of us unique is our, ex is our multiple levels of expertise and how they overlap. And I think going through different industries allows you to do that. For example, you may go into the finance industry and people who've been in this finance industry for a long time have a, you know, have a lot more knowledge. But when you combine finance and say technology, and if you know both well, this suddenly makes you unique. You're unique in that. And, and I remember this book just talking about the purple cow. And what, what's it that makes you very special? And, and I think that's, so for me, I think bringing the cross uh, uh, functional expertise across multiple industries, is something that's driven me and, and allows me to be unique in each of those. So, Stepping back a little bit, uh, and you mentioned that uh, those different, like, you know, experience in different industries. I mean, today you're active in what we call, you know, climate or clean tech uh, industry. Uh, what has been the, you know, the, the, the driver to jump into that uh, new type of industry? Uh, do you have any like aha moment uh, that you could recall or would define as such that really like uh, uh, in a way, motivate you to, to do that, uh, that jump into that industry? So I'd say the two. One is, um, and I'll talk more about it, but I'm fortunate to have an incredible uh, co-founder. And as we talk about it, I, I'd say working with somebody uh, that you enjoy being with, working with, uh, is transformative. We've worked together now for, I think, 17 years. And uh, it, it is incredible. We enjoy working with, we enjoy spending time with each other. And, and I think, uh, as people think about it, I strongly recommend finding that because uh, especially as you start up startups have a lot of good moments and bad moments and if you have somebody that you work well with when you are going through a difficult time you have somebody that can balance you out and bring you out of it otherwise i think being an entrepreneur can be incredibly lonely um, you know and there are a lot of times where you hit a lot of uh, difficult uh, difficult times and if you are on your own it's hard to to go through all those so we have that. So I was fortunate that we knew we wanted to work together and go through and think about what we could do together. I think for us, the part of the aha moment in terms of thinking about um, uh, thinking about uh, the full clean tech is to, when you think about large problems, environment is, is a clear one out there. But what brought us to think about uh, electric vehicles was a bit of the realization we spoke earlier on. Both of us were looking to go through and, uh, and purchase a vehicle. We looked at electric cars. And it didn't take long to realize that the experience was completely broken. It, it works well in a unique use case. If, if you uh, buy an electric car, it's your second car, third car, and you don't drive that far and you charge it at home, it works perfectly. Um, when it, if it's not that case, it's your only car and you're going to rely on it, 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 it doesn't work well. And so we looked at it and both of us were saying, wow, this is going to be a really tough experience <laughs> if, you just, if you go through. And then we realize what we're doing on a global perspective is we are trying to get everybody to move there. And so the first thing we did is we, we spoke to different people about how is this going to work? And they all told us that, look, in, in a couple of years, now just keep in mind, this was eight years ago. They said in a couple of years, we'll have these 350, 500 megawatt chargers. You'll be able to charge your cars in five, 10 minutes and it'll, it'll work really well. Well, lo and behold, eight years later, we still don't have those. And it's not clear how we'll get there. And the more we dug into it, we realized that the challenges were, were actually really hard to solve. So we said there's a clear opportunity here. People think there's a solution. It's, to us, it was clear that it wasn't going to be solved. And we said, if we start now, we'll come up with a solution that does work. By the time the rest will, we accept the realization that the rest of the, the, rest of the solution is not going to fall in place. So before we, we start going into details uh, about Ample, I would like to, to zoom out and kind of understand the overall context uh, that you are surfing on. So let, let's try to get your overview on the so-called EV landscape in the US today and maybe more specifically the, the change and opportunities uh, related to the EV fleets as we uh, discussed prior to the, prior the interview. So to put things back into, into perspective, maybe we you know we can start with um, you know you know some data on how much does the traditional transportation sector uh, for goods and you know goods and, and persons um, contribute to uh, GHG uh, emissions and how far are we in terms of uh, decarbonizing the, the the sector and and what are the existing uh, you know alternatives and uh, uh, and maybe adoptions besides like EV. So 
We I think why a lot of people focus initially on transportation is that transportation accounts for 40% of greenhouse gas emissions. It is an incredible amount and it's also one that's not going down. It's actually one that's been going up. So you say if you want to start off with trying to, de to solve the uh, de organization the clear place to start off is to go through and work on transportation. And I think that's why a lot of them go through and immediately hone in uh, on that. Now, if you look at it from a global perspective, we haven't made a big dent on that. You know, we might have on a global perspective, 1% of vehicles or one and a half percent of vehicles going through and, and switch over. That's definitely not enough to, to make any sort of dent in that. So we need to go through and, and solve that. Now there are other types, uh, you know, especially with hydrogen. Uh, there are other types that you can go through, and hydrogen I think is a, is a good example where that could also go through and, and help us in terms of decarbonization. There are clear, I think, segments in which it makes sense where you look at hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen, at least up to now, has had a very high cost in terms of developing infrastructure. But there are places, especially when you look at long haul, potentially in planes or other cases where it makes sense. You can go through, limit the number of uh, points you need to deploy the infrastructure, and then it works really well, especially given the uh, the, uh, the energy density of it. So I, I think there are cases in which uh, it works. But when you go back to electric, again, we haven't made a, a large dent. Now, if you look across the globe, there are places that they have, and China has gone through and over the last few years made a tremendous dent in it. And I think where they have made a dent is they've gotten a lot of people who only have one vehicle to purchase electric. That's not true of a lot of other places. And secondly, they've also made a large dent in terms of fleets. Uh, it's it's harder often for fleets and they've gone through and built it. Now, part of it, and we'll talk about that probably later on, but it's, I think they've, they've gone through and, and started tackling the infrastructure problem, which, which goes through and solves it. Uh, Europe, I think, is, is interesting where they're going through and putting a lot of uh, mandates in place to require people to move. And so you're seeing that where in many cities, the center of the city, you need to have an electric vehicle to be able to go through and, and drive in it. Those are going to be very powerful and, and force people to be able to, to go through. And they have, I think, both the, the mandates and then they also have subsidies to go in and help people get there. Uh, the US, I think, is going, a, a large part of it's going through subsidies. And they say, let's try and subsidize it to incentivize people to go through. We, we probably don't have as many uh, mandates or fines if you don't go through, but I, I think, especially when you look at California, I think California is, is sort of leading that charge. Uh, the rest of the world outside of that, uh, you know, you have pockets here and there where there is, but you don't see yet uh, a, a significant amount of electric vehicles. And I think that's where there some countries are watching to see what happens before they invest in it. Um, but I think we need to see a lot more work there to start seeing a global impact on the number of electric vehicles out there. So, double clicking on the um, fleet um, managers or fleet user, could you like maybe give us some insight in terms of like who are those uh, you know uh, fleet owners and, and companies? Who are, wh which profile are we talking about? I mean, like uh, that you have maybe identified and that are willing to move uh, to a EV solution. And, and what are the challenges and opportunities that uh, you see in the market to accelerate this EV deployment? Uh, maybe we can start with the, the challenges and then the, the opportunity and really like kind of like get this uh, this persona of the EV fleet uh, manager per se. So when you, when you think about uh, deploying electric vehicles, you do have, you can go after individuals, you can go after fleets. Going after fleets is is natural because they have a large number of cars. So if you get one fleet owner converted, you have tens of thousands of vehicles you can go through and convert. So in terms of having a large impact on decarbonization in a short period of time, fleets is a natural place to go through and start. With fleets though, a lot of fleets are, are very sensitive in terms of cost per mile. It's hard for them to compete in what they do if they can't have efficient transportation. So in order to effectively get them to move over without just saying we'll subsidize it, you need to come up with something that is, makes sense both from an economic perspective and from an operational perspective. So I think where, uh, where the difficulty for fleets moving to electric is a lot of people don't look at the holistic problem that a fleet uh, has to, to electrify. Most people just focus on the complexity of, of charging and saying if we can get the charging to work, we've solved the problem. But that only is part of the problem. Now, I'll talk about the two parts. The problem with just solving the, uh, the charging is firstly, for them, they probably need to go through and deploy a lot of charges, which means they need to go through and dig up their parking lot and install it. It ends up being very expensive to go through and do that. The second part is when those charges are on, 
they have a large power requirement, which means they probably need to upgrade the transformers, the power coming in, which is again expensive and takes a lot of time. It could easily be a 24 to 36 month wait to get that up. So once you've done those, you've dug up the, power, uh, the full park, not installed the charges, upgraded, now you have the charges that you go through and you can start working on the operational complexity of how do you get these cars in and out. But the problem doesn't stop then, for most people they assume it does. Beyond that, they have the problem of most fleets will keep the vehicles for 15 to 20 years. With electric, often as soon as the battery's gone bad, they need to get rid of it. So they could be, if it's a high mileage use case, getting rid of these cars in five, six years which means that it's suddenly gone from a, a long-term depreciation to a short-term depreciation, and you're depreciating the full vehicle. So it's a much higher cost that they have. And then when you think about the residual value, if they even try selling it because the battery is bad, the residual value is much lower. So the financial hit from that uh, is, is going to be significant. Then if you look at a, a case where they're going through and char fast charging the batteries, the cost of fast charges is higher, but the fast charging also can degrade the batteries faster. So they have not only the cost of uh, the infrastructure, but they also have the fact that they're depleting these batteries uh, very quickly. Uh, and if you're fast charging them, often you're going through and paying for batteries that are larger than they need. So with fast charging, people mostly charge their batteries to 80% and not 100%, but you pay for 100%. So if 20% of this battery that you're paying for, not using, and then the full thing gets degraded. So you have all those ones that are uh, that are challenges that you need to go through and solve. And I said last time, they do this to go green. And if you think about it from a green perspective, if you're a fleet and you purchase all these cars that electric cars have a higher carbon footprint, so it, it, you're starting off in, in the hole, so to speak, and then you use these cars, you fast charge them and get rid of them in five years, uh, it's not clear if this is better for the environment than getting a gas car and keeping it for 20 years. So in order for them to go through and really have the impact, they need to make sure that they can get these electric cars, use them for longer, use them with, a, with a renewable energy, and then you have a, a significant impact on decarbonization. So I'd like to double click a little bit on the, the charging solution deployment. I mean, we often hear like, yeah, we cannot find like chargers like uh, along the road to uh, charge my car. Or there's uh, only a few of them. but. What are, maybe we can start just by, what are the solutions in terms of charge, uh, charging points uh, and technology existing uh, today? If you have like some, you know, comparison in terms of advantages and, and inconvenience, and then maybe just like go a little bit uh, one step further in terms of like, uh, what are the, the regulation currently in place uh, driving this, uh, you know, deployment of, of blocking or slowing down uh, the deployment of like charging uh, points uh, that uh, based on what you what you explain here it's one part of the, the key element uh, to, to to go further in terms of uh, uh, EV adoption uh, at, uh, at a larger scale so th there's a lot there uh, to go through so let me start with the, the first part of it you're about going through and deploying charges and people say there are not enough charges there there are I think multiple parts for that that need to be solved Firstly, you're right, you need a lot more charges out there, which is a large cost and people have to go through and, uh, and invest in it. The problem often with charging is that your vehicle uh, is there for a long time. So if it's going to be there, your ability to charge the battery requires the vehicle to be tethered into your charging. So you can't go to very high utilization of a charger because if a charger is at say 20% utilization and you just randomly show up to a charger, you're probably going to end up waiting 50, we have 30, 40 minutes before you start charging because somebody's ahead of you. If you get to 70% utilization, you could easily be waiting a couple of hours before you start. Not a lot of people are willing to do that, which means that you naturally end up having a lower utilization in order for it to be useful. You need to keep it down because nobody wants to wait that long. So you end up with charges that end up being used a lot less. So that's the first is you, the fact that utilization cannot go high because of the inconvenience of waiting limits it. So you need to have a lot more of these out there. The second thing is that when you go through and put, turn them on, they have these power, they send you to draw a lot of power. So you need to upgrade the grid to be able to deliver a tremendous amount of power at certain points. But the grids weren't meant for that. The grid is good at from, uh, doing a large amount of power from one destination to another, and then you go down the tree structure and deliver small amount of points. But mobility is turning that on its head, and the, greens, and the grids need to be upgraded to be able to go through and deliver a tremendous amount of power for a short period of time at different points. That's a very tough challenge. 
especially when you think that in order to compete with gas, if you wanted to charge a car in five minutes, you probably need a one megawatt charger. So the, from a grid perspective, putting these very high power chargers at all these different points is a large cost in terms of charges and large cost in terms of going through and, uh, and upgrading the grid. Now with fast charging, there are a couple of things that people never talk about, but fast charging has a couple of issues. We we spoke about the degradation of the battery and, and people talk about we eventually get to solve state batteries and solve part of that. But also, the faster you deliver energy, the more uh, energy loss you have. You know, and the energy loss goes towards I squared R or square of power or current that goes into it. So if you double the, uh, double the speed, you double the energy loss. So you find a lot of fast chargers are liquid cooled. And the reason they're liquid cooled is because you're efficiently throwing energy into the air. <laughs> That's it. It's, so you could have a significant energy loss. You could lose 30% of the energy going from the uh, grid to the vehicle. And then secondly, with the current way where you have to decide ahead of time how large your battery is, often you could have a larger battery than you need, especially for a fleet, because just in the one case where you might need it, you better buy it which means two things. You're carrying a heavier battery and you're making the car inefficient. Uh, electric vehicles, often you could be spending 30% of the energy that goes in the vehicle just moving a big battery around. So those are all sort of challenges you go from a grid perspective. Do you put fast chargers, you know, if they're inefficient, how do you go through and, uh, you know, and become solve the decarbonization? How do you upgrade, uh, upgrade the grid? How do you think about your batteries getting degraded? And all those are challenges that we need to go through and solve. You ask the second part is, what are possible solutions? What brought us to battery swapping is battery swapping actually tackles a lot of those problems. Uh, the, it separates you firstly charging the battery from putting the energy into the car. So you have the ability to do it slowly over time, use renewable energy to charge the batteries while they're in the swapping station. And then the vehicle comes, you can move it very quickly into the vehicle independent of the size of the battery. So that's exactly what you do with gas. When you gas, you go there and you physically move the gas in and you leave. By doing the same thing with batteries, you give it the same benefit. So it gives you the benefit of being able to move energy very quickly into it, no matter how big your car is, but it also gives you the ability to use it renewable energy because you're, you're, taking, you're taking your time and, and you can slowly charge it when the renewable energy is available. But it gives you another benefit as well. What we solved at Ample is the ability to, uh, to be able to uh, use the same batteries in different types of vehicles. So when you look at how battery swapping has traditionally been used is each car company creates their own swapping solution, but that would be equivalent to having a gas station per type of vehicle. You know, and, and that doesn't work that well. It's not very efficient. We saw the problem is regardless of who comes in, you use the same battery. So it makes it look a lot like uh, gas. Nobody ever can come. If you one other benefit, the way we solved it, we can also choose how much battery we put into the car. So that if you're a fleet and you're not driving that far, on each route, you can put in just the amount of battery you need, which costs you less and makes your cars more efficient without compromising your ability to drive further in case you need it. So I think battery swapping solves a lot of those challenges. It solves the problem of you know, having to buy big batteries. You don't need to, you put as much you need. It allows you to charge with renewable energy. Uh, it allows you to deliver it very quickly. So it allows you now to move from gas to electric and actually have a better experience and pay less because overall you'll pay less using electric than you will uh, using gas. So I think those are two. The one last question you asked, and I'll, I'll uh, just tackle a bit, is you're talking about in terms of what we need from a legislative perspective to be able to go through and tackle that. So legislative is interesting. A lot of the uh, a lot of things we do right now involve subsidies. So subsidies are good as long as you don't require them indefinitely. I think that's a very important is that. You, you don't want people to get reliant on subsidies sort of 50 years from now, we're saying, wait, how do we get rid of the subsidies we have out there? A lot of the subsidies right now don't have a clear way to go away. For example, if you subsidize people building charges uh, and not subsidize them in terms of amount of energy they deliver, what you end up is a lot of charges in locations that are very cheap to build it because you can get a large subsidy on it, but then nobody maintains it. And right now you see, uh, we, you read reports where 40% of the charges out there are broken. Nobody's incentivized to maintain it, and so when you go there, it's not. So just incentivizing people building it doesn't. We should be incentivizing people to actually delivering energy from the charges, and only when they use you go through and do it. 
you also see, for example, that there are uh, incentives for people to buy uh, new uh, vehicles. That's beyond the change, and I'm really glad. Because before, what we did is we incentivize the people who buy new vehicles tend to be higher income earners. And so we're incentivizing people who can afford to buy cars, which is not what we want to do. We want to incentivize people who can't afford to buy their cars. Uh, on average, people buy second-hand cars, and they keep it for a long time. And by incentivizing new cars, you incentivize people who could otherwise buy it. And then when they resell it, the person buying it doesn't get the incentive. So we need to go through and think about, they talk about just, I think, the democratization of owning a car. And I think the important part is to make sure the subsidies are fairly split across all uh, across all income levels so people can go through and, and do it. One of the different legislative is you sometimes you go through and see legislation that forces people to move to electric. And you could say if you're driving ride sharing or driving a taxi, you have to move. Just mandating that doesn't solve it because you could be relegating the driver to spend 10 to 12 hours a week charging. That means they're going to earn significantly less. So by just by mandating that without find, having a real solution, you're actually putting a penalty on those drivers for no good reason. You know, you've subsidized the the, the chargers, but if you're not subsidizing their uh, their income or and requiring them to spend a lot of time, it just means that they earn a lot less, and I don't think that's fair. So I think we need to make sure we have policies that uh, incentivize all people equally, regardless of income, to purchase the vehicles. We need to incentivize infrastructure to be built in locations, including, uh, you know, uh, when you look at neighborhoods that can't necessarily afford it, we need to be make sure that we are putting charges in there because they, those people might be driving ride sharing and we want to make sure that we're not, we're not penalizing, not putting them in all the rich suburbs and not in, uh, in the locations that they're there. And then we need to make sure that we have a way for them to make the transition without earning less. So there's no penalty. If you're going to require somebody to make the transition, we need to make sure we have the solution for them to do it without a, a penalty. So I think those are the sort of the sub subsidies we have. You know, we've seen some of it come right now with the the new uh, the IRA that's going out there. We're starting to look at uh, more of these. But I think thinking of a holistic solution is important. But we, we are not putting long-term subsidies that won't go away. We are subsidizing the right things, uh, and we are subsidizing it equally so that everybody has, uh, you know, has a chance to be able to go and benefit from it. So to, to close this, uh, this section, John, uh, as everyone knows, there's, you know, there are always like some uh, controversies around like EV solution, especially related to, you know, the rare earth elements uh, coming into the, into the battery, the battery recycling and, and the source of energy used to, to charge EV. So more like on a, on a larger perspective here. So according to you, uh, what is the real impact of uh, that EV could have on slowing down climate change? Is it something really net positive or still uh, like a buzz, a greenwashing tool that people are trying to, uh, to throw out there uh, and in a way uh, what needs to, to happen to make it, uh, you know, this whole uh, industry more, more cleaner in a way and more sustainable and close to the, to the zero that we are all uh, looking for. So, you know, I think one of the things that we saw during COVID is the impact of not having tremendous amount of, uh, of uh, gas emissions in cities. It was it was incredible. It was beautiful. It's something that I think we we hope to see again in our life, <laughs> so, and not from COVID. Hopefully, from uh, from actual efforts to to decrease uh, emissions. So I think that was a wake up moment for a lot of people that there is a tremendous amount of benefit, benefit that you can go through, uh, and EVs can deliver on that. I think it's not just uh, it has a real uh, potential to go through. We need to make sure we do the things to, so that it's actually done well. Uh, but I think it has that uh, that potential to really get us there, uh, get us there quickly. Uh, and I, I, as you know, living in large cities, I dream of being able to go out there and and actually see the air clean, not breathe in the fumes from a, uh, a vehicle in front of you. So I, I, I think there is a lot. We need to make sure we're focused on it and, and we go through and and, uh, and do it properly. And, and you're seeing a lot of those. For example, I read that in in New Delhi. Uh, I think it was 12% of vehicles last quarter something that was sold were electric. A lot of it's two wheelers or three wheelers, which is incredible. That is going to start when you start seeing those double digit uh, movement from gas to electric. We'll start seeing those uh, those benefits. So I, th I think we have, and I don't think we need to solve all the problems at once because you see a lot of naysayers coming back and saying, well, the energy that's going to to charge it is not green, so we're just moving the problem from one place to the other. 
but we, we will tackle it. We have, I think, as a society, the commitment to moving to renewable energy. You're seeing a lot of that. So we don't need to wait until it happens to go through and deliver it. I, I think if we make the transition over to electric, we will also make the transition over to sustainable. And as those two come together, we'll start seeing uh, ma uh, massive gains. So I think with those, we're doing it. Electric has the chance to, to do it. We're putting uh, the mandates in place. And when we start seeing significant movement, we'll see the benefits. The other question you asked was about a lot of these, you hear a lot of the issues with the rare elements. How are they going through in mind? What's the impact we're having? And I think those are things we need to be very, uh, very careful in that we go through and, and, uh, and spend the time to make sure it's done well. But there are two parts to that. One is, it's not clear that long term what sort of batteries we really use. And I think we're very good, I think, over time in terms of finding new solutions, finding new chemistries, be able to switch to different things. So I I would not bet against uh, humanity's ability to creative solutions to solve those problems. And I think what we do is we actually go through, we get the electric knowing that again, there are people solving those problems. We should get them. And over time we can make sure that we're subsidizing the right type of uh, behavior there as well. So all three of those I think will, will come together. We will come through and, and work on new battery uh, new battery chemistries that limit the use of uh, of elements, especially elements that are uh, that are mined in ways that are uh, not acceptable. I think we'll go through into that. Uh, so we'll get to uh, right battery chemistries. I think from the vehicle as well, we'll go through. We will hit larger numbers of EV and EV penetration so that we have numbers that go through and uh, help us in terms of climate change. And I think third is we will put the work in place to get more renewable sources. And as those three come, I think we'll, that's when we'll start seeing those beautiful cities again. The fact that you'll be able to see the mountains from cities because the air is clean. So now let's go deeper into uh, into Ample. Um, I mean, you already uncovered a little bit like, uh, if you could like reframe a little bit like the, the, the story behind it and, um, you know, w which gap did you uh, did you identify initially uh, that led you to the, to the current version of, uh, of Ample? Uh, I mean, in a way, why did uh, Ample uh, have to exist? You know, and I mentioned my co-founder, Hal Hasuna. Uh, it starts off again with a desire to go through and and work together, uh, and and we want to go through uh, solving meaningful problems. I think we're lucky, especially in, in a lot of these countries where we have the ability to work on meaningful problems. And this, um, you know, once you go through and, and have enough money just to get by the needs, you have this flexibility to say what you want to go through and work on, and and decide to work on meaningful problems is uh, uh, is, is is really important. You know, I joke there are two. Two points I remember in my life. One, this is a long time ago when, when somebody said they were doing a, uh, it was sort of like a, a social network for um, uh, for CDs or something. And I was sitting and saying, wow. And another one was somebody saying they had this virtual uh, community and they're so focused on all these virtual peanuts and all that. And I was saying that it, it's when you sit those times, you go, wait, do I really want to spend my life working on you know, communities for CDs or virtual peanuts? Or this? And I just felt that like, I want to be spending my time working on more meaningful stuff. It, it's a lot more satisfying. And when, when you see the result, it's good. I'll show you a, uh, one other example, uh, not Ample related, and I'll go back to Ample, but I, I worked with uh, the, uh, this group called Healthy Villages started by uh, Donato Tramuto. And we, we went through and we were going through and opening uh, hospitals in challenged communities. It doesn't take that much money to go through, and, and this was in, in Kenya where we opened it, a maternal hospital to have a dramatic impact on maternal uh, mortality rates. M massive, we can almost go through and eliminate it. And when it really is that, it doesn't take that much money to have profound impact. You know, we actually really saving lives. It realizes you that a lot of us, actually all of us have the chance to be able to go and use our time, use our resources to have that sort of impact. So when we were, Hald and I were looking at the full uh, space and saying, we, climate or environment is something that's important to all of us. Uh, when you live in California, you realize just from from the change in climate over the last 15 years, it is really significant. I, I used to, 15 years ago, wake up in the morning and dress like it's winter, now often in garden shorts and a t-shirt and you go it, it feels nice that you go out in shorts and a t-shirt but you know that it's wrong and you know that we're not moving in the right direction you know 15 years from now what are we going to be so we wanted to be able to go through and solve that and 
And that combined with what we're saying at the time in terms of thinking about how do we make the transition? And if it's hard for the two of us to make the transition living in San Francisco, how are people in lots of other uh, countries going to go through or other cities going to go through and make the transition? So, so first it was a, a big need without a clear solution. And I feel that often you have this moment where you say the emperor has no clothes. <laughs> and I felt that a bit with uh, with EVs and what God is, is we were starting to discuss this full thing of having these super powerful charges to go through and charge cars and all. And we just said, okay, what's the probability that in two months or two years we'll have these super high charges deployed all across the world so people can make this transition? And we said it's, it's, it's very unlikely. And if people are betting on that, that, that's the opportunity. There's a gap. People think that that's going to go, and they realize that's not going to work. And if we can go through and come up with a solution by the time they have that realization, uh, we will have solved a big problem. So that was the, the hard moment saying uh, there's a large opportunity out there. Nobody's really focused on it right now, uh, but they will. And by the time they do, hopefully we'll have the right solution for it. So on the user experience uh, side, if you could maybe uh, walk us through the, the, the process, I mean, how does it work? Uh, I mean, what, ca what type of car can use uh, your, your, your solution today? You mentioned, I think, uh, every car, but uh, uh, maybe you can help us to visualize the, the, the whole process. I mean, where do we find you guys today? Uh, how do we create uh, maybe an account if, uh, if it's needed? I mean, if you can really like kind of like help us to visualize the, the whole process and maybe understand your, uh, your secret sauce here. So I'd say there are two different parts with Ample. First is we need to solve the problem of how to be able to go through and work with cars without asking the car manufacturers to change uh, the, the vehicle. The car manufacturers are producing vehicles at volume. It's a very difficult problem that you're going through and solving. And if everybody comes and asks them to make slightly tweak, slight tweaks to that car, it's very hard for them to, to do it. They're doing it at very high volume with high accuracy and, and creating these reliable, safe vehicles. They don't want to spend a lot of time making lots of tweaks. So that's the first problem we solved. And we solved it uh, in a couple of ways. I won't go into too much detail because it'll probably take, require more time. But we solved two parts from a physical perspective. Uh, what we realized is we need to develop battery packs that mimic what they have in the car right now. So that it really is a drop-in replacement. Just like you can switch tires on a car, we want to make sure we had a battery you could go through. And physically, we got a way to go through and do that by mimicking, at least from a shape perspective, how do you go through. The part that we solved also that was very difficult and unique is from an electrical perspective, every car is difficult. And we came up with a system that allows us to go through and work with them and match what the electrical requirements of the different batteries. So at, if you, once you solve those two, you can literally do a drop-in replacement where you you have a car, you put our battery back in, and the car is now swappable. You replace it and put the old battery back in it, and it's not, it's a fixed battery. So that's how we solve the car problem, and we can work pretty much with almost any car out there or any uh, bus or truck uh, that's electric uh, out there. On the flip side of that is what's the station and what's the experience out there. So we developed these fully autonomous stations that take two parking spaces, and it's a very simple experience. You literally, you, you drive in, it recognizes the car, it can go through, lift the car up, spend a few minutes, take out the used batteries, replace it with fully charged batteries, and then you drive off. So it gives you a great experience. Uh, you know, there's not much involved in terms, it's fully autonomous. But one other thing we realize is, if you wanted to have this impact, you need to be able to deploy these stations very quickly. And the third leg of the stool is we spend the time to create stations that could be deployed in a few days. So you can actually go through and roll these out at scale very quickly and keep the cost of the stations down. So I think the combination of those three uh, is what you need. You need to be able to work with uh, the vehicles without going through you know, requiring any change. If you do it, it gets difficult. You want to have a station that is a very simple experience. And then you want to be able to deploy these very uh, quickly and cost efficiently so that you can go through and, and have a large impact across, uh, across cities. So how long did it take you and, uh, and your team to, to put together the, the, the first prototype and what maybe if you can recall like the initial challenges that, uh, that you faced and how did you overcome them? I mean, and maybe today what keeps you uh, up at night? So I, I, you know, I always believe that uh, at a startup you always have lots of challenges. <laughs> you just need to make sure you're, you're working on the right challenges. I think that's the, the key one is. You know, there are always a lot of different things. Every morning there are a full set of new challenges and you just go through. So I think the key thing is spending the time, you know, Halt and I spend a lot of time going through and saying, what are the key things we need to solve to be able to go through? I feel at a startup, you're in this world of, you're working with things that are 
possible but highly improbable. Yeah, that's the world you are. It's possible and highly improbable. And so you need to be comfortable as in order to make it uh, trend, you need to be focused on on working on those improbable things and making it more probable that it happens. And that's that's uh, the, the full part. So it, the challenges keep on changing. You know, it, 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 as we went through and started, uh, you, we didn't even know what was the right form of solution. So we had to go through and do a lot of the brainstorming to think about what 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 could work. Uh, we also did a lot. There's a lot you can learn from the past. If you look up on YouTube, if you look at uh, battery swapping fleet in Spain, you'll find out that in the 1940s there was a full taxi fleet in Spain that was battery swappable, uh, and they realized that the only way to get it to work was to do battery swapping on it. So we looked at past experiences. We looked at why companies in the past failed. Learned a lot from that, and then said, "What is it that we need to solve in order to make this viable?" Then tackling those. Uh, but those are the technical challenges. You you run into other types of challenges. You know how do you how do you raise the money? How do you uh, you know how do you grow the team? How do you do it uh, successfully in in California or San Francisco without having high turnover? And so we had to look at each of those and keep on going through. Uh, but you can't you know you can't if you try to do everything you're gonna fail. So it always is a matter of prioritization of choosing the things that are most important to go through and solve and and then working on those. So. Maybe if you can, um, you know, look a little bit at the, you know, current and uh, expected economics of uh, of Ample. I mean, wh what's your uh, business model, and and who is financing, uh, in the, the, all of those like uh, charging station? I mean, do you have like a, a special model behind that? Uh, what's the the unit cost to you know to produce uh, each uh, each of them? If you can uh, share uh, with us, and and maybe what's your uh, future, you know, uh, projection that you have. So in terms of how, how you think about a hardware uh, or an infrastructure company, you traditionally when you do those, uh, you're talking about a large capital requirement. So we wanted to go through and say, how do we go through and do that without, uh, without having to raise a tremendous amount of money? And there's a couple of ways we did that. So one is how is by focusing on recurring revenue. You know, you go through and you have these vehicles that that are using your system, and and every year uh, once you bring them on, you go at uh, long term revenue for them. So the ability of having recurring revenue and visibility means that you start the year every year knowing that you have a certain amount of backlog in revenue, which really helps. The same terms in terms of thinking about how do you finance it by going after fleet customers. It gives you customers that are. Uh, credit worthy as well as sign longer term contracts and that means that you don't just need to use equity to finance that you can actually look at uh, different types of debt or other types of uh, other types of structures to be able to go through and efficiently uh, raise the money against that so say those are the two especially as you think about how the company is uh, how do you go through and limit uh, or allow you to be able to go through and give you visibility on revenue which is important so that you don't start every year so sort of in the hole and having to do brand new sales, it gives you visibility. And the other part is how do you think about not having to just rely on equity, use other types of financing to be able to go through and, and, and uh, grow the infrastructure. So maybe can you tell us a bit more about like your, uh, your competition today? I mean, in the US and, and the rest of the world, uh, why you guys are different or maybe better? How do you compare your solution uh, to other solutions available on the, on the market? So I think there are two, uh, and I should probably say three types of competitors we need to think about. Uh, the first, I think, is the most obvious one is gas. <laughs> you know, uh, and I think that's what we do really well. When you compare us to gas, we have a similar experience. You, know, you can go through get energy in a few minutes. We're cheaper because the, uh, the energy is cheaper. So you actually get a similar experience and you're going through and paying less and you're doing well uh, from the environment because you can use renewable energy in, in those vehicles. So I think when you look at that, uh, we compare very favorably uh, to it to be able to go through. There's another advantage when you look at the gas station, there's the, uh, you know, there's the environmental impact of a gas station. Not a lot of people want to have uh, a gas station right in the neighborhood. How do you clean up after it? All of that is mitigated. Uh, you, you, know, you, don't, uh, you don't have those issues there. And because you have the ability to go through and charge the batteries at the station, you know, the gas station, you have people, uh, a lot of logistics to make sure you deliver the gas to it, all that goes away. So you, you can go through and replace it with these simple swapping stations that are green and, um, and you compare very favorably. The second is how does it compare uh, with fast charging? And I think on that perspective, it, it, there are a few areas in which it, it does really well. One is the, the, the cost of deploying it. Uh, it's very expensive. And the reason fast charging is expensive is because there's a lot of 
uh, construction and digging up is involved to go through. You, you, know, you mitigate that when you don't need to. But secondly, is the ability to is the throughput. You can deliver a lot or uh, service a lot more cars with swapping than you can with fast charging. If it takes you 30 minutes to an hour per car with a fast charger, on the other hand, if you're spending a few minutes with swapping, you can go through and and, uh, and you know with one one station actually it serves a lot more vehicles, which makes it a, a lot more scalable. Then if you look at the green impact with the charger, most of the time it's not doing anything except when the car comes in. And we spoke earlier about why you can't have high utilization. So you have a charger that most of the time doesn't do anything and then the cars come, it pulls a lot of power and it's hard to make that power be renewable. And swapping station, you're, you're, you're low power, you charge the batteries over time, which is better for the batteries, less degradation, and you can uh, go through and be green. So I think from all those, it's, uh, you know, it works really well in terms of uh, 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 in terms of comparing very favorably to charging. The last is how does it compare to other swapping solutions around the world? And I think it, it compares in, in a couple of different ways. One is the ability to work across different vehicles. Uh, that is very unique. Most of the solutions are very specific to the type of uh, vehicle. Uh, and, and the same when you go through is you want to be able to do it without requiring the manufacturer to change the car. We are very unique in that is that we don't require the ma manufacturer to go through and, and change. So I think the ability to work across different vehicles, the ability to work with manufacturers without changing it, and then deploy it very quickly uh, makes it unique, I think, from a, from a swapping perspective. Last question on the on my side, John. What is your personal opinion on the, on the climate crisis? I mean, what would you tell to people who are like, you know, feeling demoralized by seeing all, all the already visible consequences and feeling it uh, of, of climate change today? As I always ask, like, are we doomed? Uh, what would you tell them? You know, I, you know, I keep on hearing people saying, you know, don't bet against humanity. And I, I, I really do believe that. I, I believe uh, we are good over time in terms of tackling large problems. And I was just reading the report yesterday about how we are now uh, going through with the hole in the ozone layer uh, that they actually say that in the next few decades it could close completely and we could have solved that problem. So I, I think we have that ability. I, when it was there, it seemed insurmountable and we'll do the work. So I think we have the ability to go through. Uh, we're not doomed and we'll... It doesn't mean that we should sit back and just say, okay, we've all solved things in the past, we'll solve it here. Uh, so I, I, I think there are two levels. I think if, you know, we have a large population of people and if each one does a little bit, uh, it has a huge impact. <laughs> so I, I don't think people just start off saying, I want to you know, move a mountain. Even if you do small things, it has large impacts. And small things done by a large number of people or multiple times is tremendous. I and mean, we, could, we could really do large things. So I, I think that's where people should start is start off with small things that you can go through and, uh, and do, and do it consistently, not just once, but do it multiple times. And I think that's where you go through. Then the second part of it is the people who are fortunate and have the means to have larger scale impact, we should do that. So I think the combination of every needs to do a part and the people who can actually go through and, and, and set up uh, organizations, solve bigger problems, tackle those challenges, fund research and all, should do that as well. And I think the combination of those two allow us to, to do tremendous things. And when you look around, and the, the, the earth is really beautiful. It's such a shame not to. I and mean, it's just you go. It is you, you travel this place and just see the natural beauty of where we live. Uh, you know, it's 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 so nice to be able to go through and try and preserve it and try and and pass it on to to future generations. So, how can uh, our community of uh, investors, founders, experts listening to the show today can uh, can help you? If you. Uh, and I would say from the investment perspective, uh, all of our investors are people who come from uh, climate change and mobility. Uh, it, the people understand the problems really well. So for people who are in the investment side and they're actually looking at this space, we'd love to speak to them. Uh, we, are, we are deploying globally. And so no matter where you are, uh, we hope to have a footprint in there. Uh, I would say also in terms of the, the partners out there, the energy companies have been great partners for us. Uh, we need to be able to go through and and work with them to be able to go through and, and deploy it. So we'd love to have those. Even the, the real estate companies, if you have real estate, we need to deploy stations and, and we can partner uh, really well. So you know, for us, uh, there's no way we can do it alone. We need partnerships. We need partnerships also with the, the car companies. Uh, uh, people create existing car companies that do a really amazing job with vehicles, but also the new car companies that are trying to create new vehicles out there. 
so all those, I think, you know, are important to us. We need to partner with them. I think that's the only way we go through and, and have the impact that we hope to have. Any question that I did not ask you that I should have for this first part of the interview? Yeah, I, I think from that perspective, we've covered a lot of it. I, I think, um, you know, often uh, where it does fall apart is what we need to do from a legislative perspective and all. I, I think we covered that well. Uh, I, I think we're in a stage right now where we're going to go through and, and put the right policies in place and, and get there. But I think the only part, uh, if I had to focus a little bit on, is equity uh, in there. We touched on it, but I think the, the divide that we see is often uh, people who are funding it and all don't see the the acuity of the problem uh, because it, they don't see it. You know, often you might say, look, I bought a Tesla and it works well, uh, but that's not the experience for everybody. So I just say from that is uh, equity of solving the problem is to one it's not only i think it's the right thing to do but we won't have the impact we do if we don't solve it <laughs> so i think not only in the equity across the larger cities but also the equity across the globe uh, you know we can't leave certain countries out the only way we solve uh, i think the environment the good thing about the environment is it's everybody's problem <laughs> you know it, it, it's it's not one where you can say look it's their problem let's ignore it uh, you can't do that and the only way we solve this problem really is by solving it and and so I think uh, at a global perspective we need to understand how do we help every country work towards this uh, you know we start to, to see some work in terms of people saying how do we put these funds together to go through uh, we saw that with the the floods in Pakistan and you know who pays for it and all but I think we need to think about equity on an individual perspective but equity on a global perspective as well as make sure that we've put this stuff in place to help every country go through and tackle this in a time frame where it'll have an impact and, and be meaningful. Thank you so much, John, for your time, incredible insights uh, on uh, the industry. Uh, thank you so much for uh, you know all the effort that you put to, uh, to build this, uh, this better world and cleaner world. So uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thanks again for joining us on the Tech for Climate podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. Stay tuned next week for more Climate Tech Insights. In the meantime, head on over to our webpage at startupbasecamp.org where we have lots more insights and resources for anyone wanting to get involved in climate tech. If you find our resources useful, please consider donating to support our small self-funded team. Don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. And see you next time.